Yes, there we go. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Dr. Funk Show. What's up, Doc? Thank you guys so much for subscribing on YouTube, on iTunes, Spotify, all the other places. Really appreciate you guys. We have a really great guest today with Van Jones. Um, he's got a lot of stuff to share on Princess Philanthropy and other things that were going on that you guys may not be aware of. Um, and I really am looking forward to having him on and him taking the time to be with us today to share those experiences that m some of us may not know to the depths. And, uh, you know, I'm really glad to have him on. And we will be having an after show after we have Van off. We'll be cutting it off and I'll be coming back on. We'll do that separately to answer some questions that you guys had. Um, and talk about some other things going on, including the serious radio station that is back today. Without further ado, I want to get to my guest. And, uh, you know, it's just I, I'm very appreciative to have him on and share his side of the story of some things and to talk about it. So here we go. Here is Van Jones. Van, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here, brother. Good to see you. You know, good to see you. Now, let's try to have for the next uh, hour or so, or a little bit under, um, turn things purple a little bit, <laughs> you know? We could all use that in our world, can't we? Always, always. For sure. Yeah, you all know, right. I... So... I, I was going to say, I love your purple tie. When, I, when I'm on air and I'm wearing a tie, I always wear a purple tie ever, ever since he uh, he passed away. I've uh, Yeah. And, and, I, and now uh, people are... Are kind enough they, they send me purple ties uh to wear so i have i have nothing but purple but before he died i never really wore purple i, I wore a uh, red i wore orange i wore green i never really wore purple uh right. but i had i had a purple shirt in my closet um the day he died which I, I think i maybe wore into a concert or something and um right. and since since then i i've never been on air with the tie that wasn't purple so wow yeah we have seen a purple ties see how that coming on that's good that you have a people sending you some but yeah i just feared this kind of looked good against the black so i was definitely gonna wear it today for that's sure it. that's it so i know some people have heard it before but how did you and prince come to be like your first uh, experience with him it was about a check being sent to you or what yeah, happened with that? i um i was uh i was working in oakland at the time this is i guess i don't know 2006 2007 um, and I had, uh, I burned out on doing a lot of the police accountability, criminal justice, juvenile justice stuff. I mean, that, that stuff, I mean, now, uh, people feel exhausted by it, but at least it's a national issue. Both political parties right. would deal with it. People forget in the nineties, both political parties were on a prison building bench. You know, Bill Clinton comes in and say, I'm going to give a hundred thousand more cops. Uh, three strikes when you're out passes here in California. California, we built more prisons than Texas. So it was both parties coming after us. And I spent my 20s and 30s uh, you know, suing police departments as a Yale Law graduate and an attorney and uh, you know, blocking the construction of the super jail in Oakland for kids and helping to close uh, five abusive youth prisons. So by the time I got into my late 30s, I was really, really uh, tired. And so I turned to this new program that uh, we called the Oakland Green Jobs Corps. And the idea was to get kids off the street corners, kids who had been in trouble, get them trained to put up solar panels uh, in Oakland. So you're fighting pollution, you're fighting poverty, uh, you're bringing together social justice with environmental uh, solutions. And uh, Prentice found out about it, he heard about it. And all of a sudden I get this you know, pretty big check, but it was anonymous. And you know, if you ever work in a city like Oakland, Detroit, Chicago, you never take anonymous money because you just don't know where it's coming from. And, right. you know, you, you, it's very easy to wind up in trouble. 
Uh, and so I just kept sending this check back. And I don't remember now if I sent it back two times or three, but I just was like, look, send it, send it back, return the center. We're not, we're not accepting anonymous money. A lot of money, not gonna accept it. So finally this, this guy, I wish I could remember his name, a, a lawyer for, for a lawyer calls. And he said, you know, and he sounded panicked. I mean, the guy sounded like something was really wrong. Right. And he was like, please accept this check. And, you know, it's from a good source. Well, I said, I'm not accepting any anonymous checks. I'm sorry. Right. And, um, and he said, well, I can't tell you it's from, but I can tell you his favorite color is purple. Uh, and all of a sudden, I'm like, holy crap. So I said, well, you, I said, now you got the same problem. He says, why? I said, because now I'm not going to, I'm not going to cash it. I'm going to frame it. <laughs> and, uh, and so he, he sent the word back to Prince. Prince thought that was hilarious. And um, suddenly I'm every now and again, you know, he was, you just get these mysterious phone calls, no warning, um, no, uh, no return call, just, you know, this is Prince. And um, when I went to the White House, you know, and, and so he was supportive of what we were doing. He thought what we were doing was, was important. Right. Uh, so did Barack Obama. I went up in the White House for six months, wind up leaving, you know, under fire because I you know, had such a left wing berserkly you know, West Coast left radical past that in those days you couldn't work in the White House to be controversial. Uh, that's no longer the case. But in those days, you could not be a, a White House official and have a controversial kind of cloud hanging over you. So when I left the Obama White House under fire, one of the first people who called me was Prince. Uh, well, he said, where did he want to talk with me? And then um, and, and with, the, with the time he was going to call and then he called. And then this time it, it was it was more sober and it was more, hey, you know, he said, you're the most controversial man in America right now. And um, I said, yeah, for better or for worse. I mean, at this point, you know, Fox News is kicking my butt, um, you know, calling me a communist and a 9-11 truther and all this stuff. Um, I was I had been a Marxist when I was younger, but I was certainly not a 9-11 truth truther. And um, and suddenly uh uh, you know, he says, well, you're the most controversial you know, man in America. I said, well, for better or for worse. He goes, well, I think for better. I want you to come and see me at Paisley Park. And then he just hangs up. And of course, I don't, I don't have the phone number. I don't know how to get there. I'm like, holy. Sh-. So about 10 minutes later, I'm in a pure panic. And uh, somebody calls and says, hey, you know, princess, you're coming down here. You know, mm-hmm. you get your ticket. So suddenly um, I'm at Paisley Park uh, with my hero you know, from me, from mm. childhood. Uh, and, uh, it just changed, it changed my life. That's craziness. Now is that solar company in the Bay area? Is that still around right now or what's going on with that? You know, um, it's called solar mosaic. Uh, you know, uh, th- that particular program is no longer around, but that whole effort led to a company called solar mosaic, which is kind of a community owned, um, kind of almost like a collective, cooperative on solar and that's still around and they and they still give Prince the credit uh for putting about a quarter million dollars into that company getting it started for no he didn't want any stake in the company he didn't want any ownership in the company he just put the money in to get them going and that's the kind of guy he was I mean he makes these these decisions that you know a normal business person would think were crazy but that was his philosophy he didn't want credit he, he didn't want uh, I mean, you know, he, he put money into Harlem Children's Zone. He put money into uh, Black Lives Matter when it first got started. He wanted no credit. He, he, didn't, want, he didn't want anybody you know, feeling like he was doing it because he wanted to have his name on a building or his name on a scholarship or, you know, look at me, look at me. Right. He, his understanding of his faith as Jehovah's Witness was he could not be involved in politics in any way. And he could not be involved in, in uh, getting credit for ch- his charitable work. And so, uh, you know, the, the six, seven years I was, I was with him, you know, he he made tremendous uh, contributions financially. Uh, helped to start the Dream Corps, helped to start Rebuild the Dream, helped to start uh, Yes, We Code, uh, helped, helped so many things I was working on. Um, and he was helping other people as well. A lot of people, they don't know that about him. They mm-hmm. just think they, they you can see in the lyrics how much he cares, uh, but they had no idea that he was putting as much money into the social change as any Bill Gates or or uh, or, or, or or you know all these names that kind of get out there as, as philanthropic on a percentage basis 
of, of his wealth, he gave a lot more than anybody else and got and, and won no credit. Right. And as you put that, of course, with the Jehovah beliefs and then him also not wanting to know where it came from, which is something that he was practicing long before that as well. And then uh, you had another um, program that you were supporting for the Welcome to Chicago shows, I believe in 2010. And of course, you guys went on The View. Um, why am I forgetting her name right now? Sorry, yeah, you guys did that. And how did that come to be of him wanting to now to, to concentrate from the Bay Area to now Chicago, although he was doing stuff worldwide? Yeah. How did that come to be? You know, he, he would just he would just do stuff. Um, we had been actually I don't think I've ever talked about this. We had actually been planning to do a really big thing uh, in Chanhassen, you know, the you know, right there around Paisley. And he had this whole vision of uh, kind of doing a big community festival. Um, and it would have been right there and it would have been an annual event. And so we've been working toward that and building toward that. Mm -hmm. And he somehow decided that it, it was it was an ill it was ill considered. But he didn't he didn't come right out and just say, hey, this thing we've been working on, planning on, I don't want to do it anymore. He calls me and he says, what do you think about the word united? I was like, I think it's a good word. Mm -hmm. He says, what do you think about the word center? Now they asked me that word too. <laughs> right. So why don't we go to the United Center in Chicago and do everything that we're talking about, but let's do it at the United Center. I think that's better. I was like, Whatever you want to do, man. You know, like, like I, you know, he operated at such a high level of, you know, the frequencies he was listening in, into. So all of a sudden, we're not, we're instead of going, you know, doing this this festival in Chanhassen, suddenly we're doing it in Chicago at the United Center, and it was a brilliant move on his part because, um, you know, obviously it's easier to do something like that um, at a at a at a venue like that, but we did it totally differently. I mean, we, you know, no alcohol, none of that stuff was allowed. And the, all the whole concourse, we brought in community-based organizations, community-based businesses, not-for-profits, children's organizations, youth organizations. And we, we, we had this little, this thing that he came up with where we gave everybody when they came in a card. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you punch the card, you know, it's like, you know the, the north, south, east, west of the, of the building. So if you if you walk the full concourse and got somebody to punch you know your card north you know south east west all the way around, right. then you take that card and you put it into the lottery and have the opportunity to be way down front. Well, what that meant was all of a sudden everybody is patronizing all of these community businesses, going to all these different non for profits and, and, and just learning about so many positive organizations that were in Chicago. The people in Chicago didn't know were there, so it's just a genius thing that he came up with to kind of, you know, we're going to use this, you, you know, this, you know, famous venue, United Center, and you've seen so many Chicago Bull games there, whatever, but we're going to take it over, we're going to give it to the community, and we're going to have choirs and all stuff going on, and, 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 and because people want to be close to me, I'm going to make, I'm going to use the fact that everybody wants to be on the front row close to me, I'm going to make them get close to each other, and make them get close to these community organizations, and uh, it, it helped a lot, it helped put a lot of those <clears throat> On, on solid ground, um, but you, if you, if, why did we go to Chicago? Because Prince said we're going to Chicago. That's why. <laughs> there you go. You know, for United and for Center. Yeah, for exactly. sure. Now, then we have yes, we code. Now, did that happen after uh, the murder of Trayvon Martin? Yeah, you know, it's so interesting because the way that he taught us, you know, you know, Prince had this he. He, he had so many different groups and, and networks and networks and networks. And he was very, you know, he never really wanted this group to know what that group was doing. And I don't know if that was because he was just testing all of us or whatever, but, you know, I was at, at Paisley Park around the time of the exoneration of Trayvon Martin's killer, uh, uh, George Zimmerman, whatever his name was. And of course, everybody there was upset and I don't know if it was the same day or a few days later, but it was it was it was still a live kind of a controversy that people were talking about, and we were all fussing about it, and complaining about it, racism, 
blah, blah, blah. And, um, and I, I started noticing that Prince, he had participated early in the conversation, but now he wasn't saying anything. And we're all getting more and more worked up, but he's still not saying anything. And you know, Prince had a way of looking at you the way that a sober person looks at a drunk person. You know, just like, you know, that look like, okay. And so I started realizing, okay, this guy's kind of, he's not really with the conversation anymore. And I, and I kind of looked at him, he kind of looked at me and he said, well, he said, well, man, you know, whenever they see a black kid wearing a hoodie, like a hoodie, because, you know, Trayvon had that hoodie, uh, they always say, there goes a thug. Yeah, that's true. He said, but they see a white kid wearing a hoodie. They say, there goes Mark Zuckerberg. Because at that time, Mark Zuckerberg used to wear a hoodie all the time. Now he's, he's grown up, he's like a dad. But at the time, he used to wear a hoodie everywhere. And it was kind of uniform in Silicon Valley. All these white kids going to, going to work wearing hoodies, making a billion dollar company. Right. And so he said, you know, why do you think that is? Uh, you know, why is it when a black kid wears a hoodie, he's a thug, when a white kid wears a hoodie, it's Mark Zuckerberg. Why do you think that is? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe because of racism. Mm -hmm. said, yeah, yeah, that, that could be. He said, but maybe also, maybe we haven't created enough black Mark Zuckerbergs. Where are the black Mark Zuckerbergs? Mm -hmm. And why aren't you civil rights guys working on that? Mm -hmm. Now, I had never thought about it that way. And, that, and Prince had that ability. He was like cueing on something like a fashion thing or a, something nobody's paying attention to. And he right. used that to, to just completely flip the paradigm. Mm -hmm. And of course, Prince hated racism, but he also believed in possibility and excellence and you know, you know wanting to think, you know, he had come from a humble background. He, he believed that people could overcome things. Um, and so, so just at the top of off the top of his head, he just kind of came up with this vision. He said, "You know, Van, what I want to do, I want to go to uh, New Orleans because we had been in New Orleans a few, a few years earlier. So I was, uh, we had been in New Orleans. In fact, we had not been in New Orleans yet. So I want to go to New Orleans. I want to perform for twenty five thousand kids, and I want them all wearing hoodies." And I want all of them to know how to code computers, just like Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. And then I want to go to the West Coast, do the same thing. And I want to go to the East Coast, do the same thing. And I want to go to Chicago or you know to um, you know to, to Minneapolis, do the same thing. Hundred thousand kids, all wearing hoodies, just like Trayvon, mm -hmm. but they all know how to code like Mark Zuckerberg. This was his vision. He said, you know, kind of like, you know, looked at me, kind of like, you know, go make that happen. You know how he would do. And all of a sudden, I'm like, what? How the, I was, I was just talking about the, the, the verdict. I didn't want to. So right. suddenly I've got this impossible assignment to figure out how to get a hundred thousand young young people, uh, uh, you know, trained to be computer coders. Out of that was born Yes We Code, and we launched Yes We Code in New Orleans at at, at the Essence Festival, and that that program persists today. We still haven't got to a hundred thousand, but we've had partnerships with some of the, you know, best. Uh, technology companies, we've trained a bunch of people and we're still grinding away at it. But he would have these visions. Mm -hmm. Just the same way he would have a vision for a song or for a film or for a music video or for a dance sequence or for art. He'd have visions for social change. And you know, he would rely on me and other people um, to try to get out there and make those dreams come true, make those visions uh, become real. Right. Now, where is Yes We Code right now and trying to make that happen? Well, in this house at uh, the Dream Corps, which is a legacy organization for Rebuild the Dream. Rebuild the Dream was what was launched at right. um, uh, in Chicago. Um, and so it's still there and it's still grinding away. Mm -hmm. 100,000. <laughs> uh, right. uh, the, the mission became not just to teach them how to just code in general, we want to get them employed and get them successful. So, you know, we, 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 we wind up stretching out the, uh, the, the deliverable. So that it takes it, makes it longer and harder to do. And frankly, uh, it has been harder than we thought at that time. So uh -huh. you have true inclusion in the technology sector. 
that's still a failing, I think, of, of the technology sector, a failing of communities of color uh, to really get, because listen, you know, outside of the entertainment industry, sports, hip hop, music, right. acting, you don't see a lot of wealth creation happening in African-American uh, and other disenfranchised communities. Entertainment, yes, but you don't see yet a lot of that. So um, you're just now beginning to see the Steph Curry's of the world and others beginning to become smart in the technology sector. It's starting to open it up, starting mm -hmm. more play. Um, Robert Smith, the black uh, billionaire who gave away the, who took away all the student loans for the kids at Morehouse. He's involved in the financial technology sector, so-called FinTech. You're beginning to see it now, but it's, it's right. a long time coming. Jay-Z, obviously with Tidal, which of course Prince had a very interesting role in getting Tidal started, which I don't know if you ever talked to people about. But yeah, you know, uh, yes, we code is, and uh, it's we're, we're still we're still grinding away at it. Now, since you brought up the title situation, what what was happening with that? Since people, if you can talk about it, if you feel comfortable yeah. talking about it. Well, I mean, I, I, I just that I can't stress enough how much respect Prince had for Jay Z, and mm -hmm. vice versa. And people always forget it was Prince. And I guess David Bowie in the 90s, who were the first ones to put their music on the internet. Right. And not been done. The internet right. wasn't even really known. You know, it wasn't, it was like, what is that? You know, internet, uh -huh. what is that? People call it internets. Uh, uh, they would call it internet as opposed to the internet. Um, people didn't know what the hell it was. And all of a sudden, Prince right. put his music on internet. What is internet? What, what channel is that? What is internet? So, you know, people forget that now, of course, we all live in it, but. Right. In the 90s, that wasn't even a thing. So Prince always wanted control mm -hmm. of the relationship between himself and his fans. He hated the idea that all these middle people who, as he said, would always say, couldn't even play the guitar, mm -hmm. are putting themselves between him and the fan, all, all you know, managers, agents, attorneys, technology companies, distributors, record labels, all these people are, you know, eating off of his plate and he's just wanting to take his genius idea and put it into the ear or put it into the eyeball of his fans and so that's why he had the subscription service you know mpg uh, uh fan club he was always trying to figure out some way to disintermediate all of these middle people and he right. hated, hated itunes because he was like why the hell he said you know why does steve jobs Get my money. Steve Jobs can't play the guitar. What well, I don't understand. And he hated that the MP3, the he said that, you know, he was putting all this stuff into the music and it just it, he could he couldn't it wasn't coming through on right. IT. He actually wanted there to come up somebody to come up with a, a more rich uh, file sharing opportunity. I mean, he had so many different ideas, but he hated the idea. Um, I mean he obviously loved and respected Steve Jobs as a person, but he just hated the idea of any technology company that wasn't owned by an artist, that frankly wasn't owned by him, getting in the way, messing up the music. Now it's all flat. You can't hear all the genius he put in there, all little tiny little things, you can't hear it. And then getting money. And then now killing off the CDs. And so then here comes Jay-Z with title. Uh -huh. And Prince just loved that. He loved the idea, here's an artist who is taking control of the technology, uh -huh. you know, He's an, he's an artist that now he's got his own label and he's got his own technology. And Prince just thought that was great. Right. Um, but, you know, initially Jay-Z was trying to make him be a kind of a business partner, kind of a part of the company. Prince, again, he didn't do, he, he, he didn't believe in that. You know, he, he was like, oh, you know, I don't want to do it. And, you know, people like Phaedra and other people who were trying to give him good business counsel, like, well, listen, Jay-Z would be a good business partner for you, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then later on, when the whole world conspired to kind of take title down, then Prince got involved and put a lot of his music over there at title. And, um, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, well, he, he could have done that in the beginning and right. got a huge amount of money. He turned down the money and then still wound up putting his music over there. But in, I believe for someone like Prince, he, he thought that this is Jay Z's idea. You know, it, it should be his company. Nobody should go over there and try and take dollars out of his pocket. 
Now, if he gets in trouble, we should all go and help him, but not for the money, just to help another artist. So he saw it totally differently. Uh, and, um, and anyway, so, uh, but he was fascinated with technology. He, he understood that it was gonna be an important part of the future. He wanted young people to be involved in it. Uh, he wanted to support Jay-Z, who was trying to do a big you know, play in it. It was just you know, one of the main facets of his unbelievable personality. Right. Now, before we get into some other things, let's talk about some of the fun things that that Prince would do would be. And I saw that's why I first met you, although I didn't have my identity out there. Yeah, yeah. Some of the Sayers Club shows that Prince would do in L.A., uh, some of the yeah. ones after Jimmy Kimmel and some that Liv Warfield did. Um, we're seeing Hannah Welton in here and Shelby J. What's up, ladies? Glad mm -hmm. you're in here for support. But yes, these after shows, and I, I would see you there. Yeah, would be a a, a fan a, a friend of mine named Eric Green, who's a big Star Trek person, would be wanting to talk to you about stuff like that. But these after shows were always so amazing, and you were able to be part of those experiences. Like, what were those? What were those like? Because that instead of doing business with them, you were able to enjoy the music, chill out for a bit. Yeah. You know. Well, you know that's the crazy thing about. You know, those of us who are, you know, you know, Hannah and other people can tell you know better stories than I can because she got a chance to spend more time with them, uh, so oh, wow. than, than probably you know anybody in, in near the near the end. But right. the thing about about him was that first of all, he was nocturnal, and, and by by which, as best I could tell, he was six hours off from everybody else. So for you, it's midnight. To him, it's only six o'clock at night. Right. For you, it's six o'clock in the morning. To him, it's just now midnight. So he, you know, he would just fuck up your whole, mess up your whole brain because you start hanging out with him. All of a sudden, you look up. It's four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning. Right. And where did the time go? Whatever. But he would get in those between that one a.m. and five a.m. You know, you know, period. Right. And he'd be so creative and want to play, you know, ping pong and all this kind of stuff. But it would be so cool, you know, even after a big show, sometimes you do a big show, he still went to those after parties. He still, he, like, he liked that better, I think. I think he liked those smaller venues. I think he liked being able to just kind of jam with people, you know, come up with new riffs, just just be. He, 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 did, he did music, he just secreted music the way the pancreas secretes insulin. You know I mean? It's just, it's just kind of how he was, it's his way of being. Um, right. So, those, those shows were a lot of fun. I'll tell you, though, the, the, the funnest thing we ever did, from my point of view, and, and Hannah may disagree, but the funnest thing we ever did was in New Orleans. After we did the big show launching Yes We Code, we went to House of Blues. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that one because, you know, House of Blues in New Orleans is like three stories. Uh, you know, you can, oh, you can see the stage, but you have like three levels, right? So he's there and he's jamming and then people are on stage and they're doing what they're doing. But, but now it's like two o'clock in the morning, people are drinking, stuff he didn't like, people are trying to talk to each other, people are trying to figure out who's gonna hook up with who, who's gonna hook up with who. But they're starting to really jam on, on the stage. Mm -hmm. But the attention is starting to kind of drift away, float away. And he's starting to, re they're really starting to get into something magical. So Prince turns around, he kind of has his back to, the, to everybody, kind of Miles Davis style for a little bit. Right. He turns around, t grabs the mic, he says, uh, lights out. Nothing happens. Lights out. So they, they knock the lights out in terms of this on stage. So it's black on stage. He goes, all the lights. All the lights. So a minute of confusion goes by. And then suddenly the entire building is now black. So you're standing there at the bar. You can't move. It's black. You're going down the stairs. You better stop and grab something. It's black. I mean, black. Right. And then they keep playing. Now you have no choice but to listen to what he's doing on stage. And it was some of the best. That was probably the, one of the best jam sessions, not the best jam I've ever heard in my life or I heard of in my life. Um, and for about 20 minutes, you had, I don't know, thousand people just frozen in the dark <laughs> at the House of Blues listening to Prince just jam. And then all the other musicians on stage, they can't see anything either. So they're having to follow him just with their ears, right. it was unbelievable. So Prince would, I mean, Prince would do stuff. I mean, I'm sure that was, wasn't recorded. I mean, but I think some of the best music ever played was played by Prince and, and, and his friends and 
you know, people like Anna and Josh and other folks, uh, ju you know, just, just fooling around, just fooling around. Right. Those were always good times and fun times. It'd be a little bit chaotic before, <laughs> but the after shows were kind of like, even, even the show, it's like, you love the show, but the after show would be a little bit more where we can chill for a bit. Yeah. Enjoy yeah. everything going on. Just enjoy um, it. All the pressure's off. Right. Now, talking about something else, the title had something to deal, do with was the Baltimore concert. Sure. Um, you know, I was there. Let's talk about that and those experiences. Because he brought out the family members uh, of, of people that were there, right? Trayvon Martin's family was there and other people were there as well, correct? Yeah, pe people who had lost loved ones in that, that whole Black Li initial Black Lives Matter period where there was you know, somebody getting killed every other week and, and, and the country was in an uproar. And then finally in Baltimore, Freddie Gray just mysteriously killed and uh, real disturbances, uprising in Baltimore. Prince wants to go there on Mother's Day. And um, so we go there and um, he had this idea, he wanted everybody to wear gray, not purple, but gray, after you know, Freddie Gray. And, um, uh, and it was a, such a powerful concert. Mm -hmm. And there were a few big names who were there. Um, but he brings out the family members of all these kind of you know famous cases of, of, of that period the mom that it's mother's day and they're all dancing on stage and prince is performing he performs purple rain and um it's just really powerful powerful thing and he had the song baltimore uh he had written you know about that. one of his last real anthems um, about justice you know he wrote so many of them and um you know it was uh and, and the crazy thing about it was he put, sometimes he would put these, these couches, these sofas on, on stage. Uh, yeah, Rally for Peace. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, uh, and sometimes he put these sofas on stage. And so, uh, you know, his friends could literally just be on stage with him as we were. So we're just sitting on stage with him while he's performing, sitting on these couches. Um, right. What, what's the guy with the, the, the big afro from the roots? Uh, Westlove? Questlove was there. Questlove had his own recliner up there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but nobody ever noticed that there was just a bunch of, like, just no music, no talent losers sitting up on stage because it was Prince. Everybody was so focused on him. He was, he was just so magnetic that the fact that he had just a bunch of ragamuffin Sesame Street nobodies sitting up on stage never had an impact on the show. But it changed my life because I was able to sit on stage and see the world the way that he sees it. Now, if you think about it, when you go to a concert, what do you see? You see the back of a bunch of people's heads and their cell phones and the stage, and that's it. That's your entire view, the back of heads and cell phones. When you're on stage, I never thought about this before until him and being up on stage with him. The, 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 the geometry and the yeah. physics mean if you're in the crowd and you can see him, mm. he can see you. Right. It's a law, it's a law of physics. Mm. So suddenly my view of the concert is all of these faces and you can see, you know, when the lights sweep up, the lights go, you can literally see every face, just like every face can see him. He can see your face and you're looking into every color, every shape. I mean, at Prince concert, you've got black, white, brown, old, young, hip hop, punk rock, and everybody's welcome. There's no such thing as like a stranger or you don't belong here at a Prince concert. That may not be true at a Taylor Swift concert or some other concert, you know, because guy for one demographic, as great as Taylor Swift is, everybody is welcome at a Prince show. And it's the only thing like that I've ever seen, except maybe like when Obama was running for president the first time. And you can look out, you can see all these faces and they're all on the same accord. They all have the same look of joy. And I'm like, no wonder he thinks anything is possible. When he looks at the world, he just sees every color on one accord. He sees every color on the same beat. He sees every color 
every kind of human being united. So he knows it's possible. So that's why I think it was so painful for him, all the injustice and poverty and discord and nonsense. I don't know what he would have made of the era that we're in right now. Uh, but he really wanted to see the, uh, the world be better. And I got a chance to get a little bit of a glimpse of, of, of what his music was able to create uh, around him. And I'm still trying to, to deliver on, on, on the goodness of that. Right. There's so much of, of that stuff going on still. Now, were there things that you and Prince discussed that didn't happen and you were hoping would happen? You know, like, I know that's a loaded question. Yeah. But so many, many so many things. things. Well, so many things. I mean, he, um, you know, he loved African history and Egyptian history. And, you know, he had so many different eclectic uh, things that he was into. But, you know, he, he, he got interested in a city called Amarna, Amarna which had uh, like a, a city in Egypt that had disappeared. And he was just fascinated by this city. And he was like, we should, re we sh we should build a city. Right. Uh, he was, that's what he was saying near the end. He was like, we should just build a city, um, you know, and, and just make it be how it's supposed to be. And have everybody who's cool live there. It'll just be something that the whole world could really appreciate. And all of us could be together. Because um, he, he just, he, for some reason, he never got the point. That it's just too damn cold in Minnesota for all right. of us to be, uh, uh, yeah, Hannah's saying there's nothing but unity, peace, and love, is the, enjoy. At the Baltimore concerts, yeah. Yeah, um, that's, you know, and so, uh, so for whatever, for whatever reason, Prince never got the hint that maybe if he had, you know, spent more time in Miami or LA or something, he was in LA a, a bunch, that we would all want to hang out more, but you know, the middle of winter in Minnesota is not that fun. But he had this vision that we should build a city. And I told him, I said, you know, that's, that's kind of hard to do. I mean, that's like building a city, that's a lot. And his view was that, you know, if he could, you know, if he got full control of his catalog of his music, he could borrow against that and have enough money to buy a city and or, or build one. And, um, and I still said, you know, Prince, I, I, that's, that's a great vision, but man, that's going to be hard. And he said, he said, Walt Disney did it. Epcot. Right. He said, Walt Disney did it. I said, that's a good point. He said, um, he said, and all Walt Disney had was a cartoon mouse. You know how many hits I got? <laughs> right. So he was like, if Walt Disney can have a cartoon mouse and use that to build a city, Epcot, in uh, Florida, why can't he use all of his hits to do something as, as great? Uh, so he had so many different dreams and visions and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and a lot of stuff I do to this day. You know, it's still in keeping with the direction he was trying to push the whole camp, you know. Right. Uh, be more involved, help more people, bring people together, use technology for good. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I can't, I don't know what my life would have been if I hadn't met him. I, I mean, look, I'm a hard worker. I, I care about the world. I would have done something. But he just created in all of us a sense of, of, of freedom to really dream. And, um, you know, I think about him every day. Now, when we talk about those things, someone brought up that there was like an app that that they were that you were working on or were aware of. Like Prince was either trying to do music or or sell tickets to his shows, as I could do with the music club. What happened with that? Oh my God! What a what a roller coaster! So <laughs> Prince decides he wants an app. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know anything about apps, <laughs> you know. But he says he wants an app, and, you know, and uh, you know, what's it, it's going to be called the Vault, and it's going to be this whole kind of way to access all the music and all that stuff. He had an incredible vision for it, but you know, how Prince was he didn't want to sign any contracts. He had this whole stigma about contracts. When he was a kid, he signed this contract with Warner Brothers, and it ruined his life. And they tried to steal his name, and you know, he had to act, you know, he had to you know literally stop calling himself the name. He was very. He would never stop being. He never stopped being pissed off about that, about that whole Warner Brothers situation. Even after you know he beat him and got his masters back, you know thanks to Phaedra and all that kind of stuff. He never, 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 never stopped being pissed off about the fact that uh, they tried to. They, they wouldn't let him use his name. 
that that his name was Prince Rogers Nelson. His mother named him that. And all of a sudden, he signs a piece of paper, and a corporation is telling him, "We own your name." That for him was a deep offense. When he was writing "slave" on the side of his face and that type of stuff, I didn't know him in those days. But that, I mean, that he, that the, the, the indignity of that, the injustice of that, never went away from him. And so, um, so this idea of an app where he could control it all and he could own it all and, and, and he could give people access directly. He thought that was great, but he didn't want to sign any contracts because the last time he signed this contract, all of a sudden, you know, there's some sneaky language in there and Warner brothers, you know, back in the day, literally tried to take his name. His mother gave him and she says, I'm like, well, it's very hard to build a piece of technology when you can't sign a contract with anybody. Right. So we went through so much hell. Um, but of course it was Prince and so different technologies and other people, you know, were excited and interested at different times. But, and, and we had some beautiful markups, man, if I could find those markups, I mean, this would have been the app to end all apps. I mean, it was, you know, you, you, you would go through a door and there was a stairwell and all these different, I mean, it was, it was like a video game of, 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 of music and, and genius, but, um, he, uh, but we could just never get it, get, get all the things finalized and approved. So right. it's one of those things that, that didn't, that didn't come, come through. Right. And just for a comment in there, Ruth, uh, let's get Michelle Anthony to hear her side of the story on a future thing. Um, now I talk about the contract and everything with Warners. I'm just curious if this ever came up at all, you know, it's four years removed that he's no longer here and we get this constant question. You know, I've heard it before to where people like wanted him to make a will and he wanted nothing to do with it. Did you have any conversations with him about that, that you could share, you know? I, I, I don't want to divulge in any, any private conversations at that level, but what I will say uh -huh. is that, you know, he, he, he 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 was very resistant to conversations like that. Right. And, and I'll give you my theory. He never explained to me why he was so resistant. Uh, but he, you know, he would he would go blank on you. Like he would just, when you would raise it, anything like that, he would just, he, he had that force field. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But it's like, boom! And you cross the line. And, and you don't know what you've done wrong. And you're kind of trying to figure out how to <laughs> deal with it. Um, and so but he was like a young guy, you know, still in his 50s. And, and, you know, from our point of view, you know, healthy vegetarian. So it wasn't a big deal, but it was just it was bad form not to just have all your shit in order. You know, your taxes mm -hmm. and your insurance and your will and your trust. And it's, it's just it's just how you do business. So why right. is it every time you start leaning up toward this issue? Boom. It's like no go zone. Don't want to talk about it. And so as I as I reflect, because I've thought about it so many times, my theory, and it's just a theory, everybody else but others will have their own theory. But my theory is it was bringing up his child that died. My belief is every time we mention the will, he's thinking, well, who am I going to leave my stuff to? Well, you know, he had that child that you know, lived for six to eight or seven, however long it was, and he doesn't have any other kids. So when you say will, that means heirs. I don't have any heirs. I lost my right. child. I don't know if that's why he was that way about it, but my 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 belief in now thinking about it all these years is that it must have brought up for him a lot of pain about his child that died. And that, that and, and then now you gotta deal with, well, who am I gonna leave it to? Am I gonna leave it to Hannah? Am I gonna leave it to Josh? Am I gonna leave it to you know, all of a sudden you're in some whole world that you don't wanna be in that it'd be super easy if it was his kid, but now it's, you know, so I just think every time, and I'm not saying I try to bring it up with him every day because he got the impression pretty quick and he didn't want to talk about it. But everybody says now, well, you should have done this and you should have done this and you should have done that. I'm like, you try to make Prince do something he don't want to do. Good luck with that. Like he, that's not the kind of dude he was. I mean, you couldn't make him do something. Um, right. Like that. And so, um, but I've, I've thought about it so many times. Why was he so reluctant or so resistant on those issues? I think I think it had to do with the fact that he only had one kid and that kid died. And so who's he got to leave it to? 
Someone else may have a better theory. That's my theory. Right. And of course, he did have wills when he was married, but that doesn't transfer over. And there was nothing done in the 80s or go back to that. We know that there was wills at those times. Yeah. Now, again, probably instead of a theory for this, like from your unofficial vantage point, how do you see like this moving forward with what's going on? It's four years removed. There's a lot of stuff that he probably wouldn't agree with that's going on. Um, but I mean, like just aside from the music, what can be done with Paisley Park and to preserve his legacy going forward? You know, the Beatles have done such a great job of reintroducing the Beatles to a new generation. You know, every 10 years, they, they really keep that thing going, you know, and they can do that because the Beatles music is really extraordinary. Um, you know, with Elvis Presley, you know, he's not, you know, nobody's going to be talking about Elvis Presley 20 years from now. I mean, he was just sort of kind of a, once that generation dies off, you know, that's gone. Um, right. You know, the underlying music is, isn't that great. And so, um, uh, so what I would say is that I would love for the hits and you know whatever 50 you know there's like so many hits that he had for those those to continue to be lifted up but i think that that you could take his less familiar music and mm -hmm. combine it with a lot of these new artists who are coming on and i don't just mean musical artists i mean you know video game artists uh, you know virtual reality artists augmented reality artists i think that i think that the he was so future oriented um, uh, he was so ahead of his time, you know, because he's, he's trying, he, he's trying to basically invent Spotify in the nineties. <laughs> he's trying to invent title in the nineties. Um, that I think that there's still so much that can be done with music that isn't known by people. Uh, and, you know, so that, that's something I would, I would love to see. I would love to see a cartoon about Prince and the revolution. You know, I would love to see just like whole new kind of expression of, of him and how cool he was and how amazing he was. Um, uh -huh. you know, that's not my that's not my role uh, in this overall you know crazy network. Um, but right. I do think that it takes a lot of effort right. to keep remixing and remixing. For a while, they were doing a good job with Tupac. They kept kind of remixing and coming out with stuff and keeping him him alive. And then his mom died, something like that dropped off a little bit. Now it's coming back. Um, you have to work hard to keep to keep an icon an icon. Right. The cartoon, it's interesting because that Mike Judge uh, series on Showtime that they had that had the time and he had Prince and then, of course, the one that uh, Ruth and Quest did about the Super Bowl. That was interesting. I'd love to see more of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think stuff like that is just it's just cool. It's shareable. It's snackable. It keeps them in the buzz. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and people people understand we're living in Prince's world right now. Mm -hmm. You know, Prince took on the racial binaries, the gender binaries, the sexuality binaries, you know, all these different things that, we, that society is just now trying to wrestle with. This dude was dealing with the stuff in the 80s. I mean, the 80s, he was, you know, wearing mascara and high heels and and uh, and at the same time could take your wife if he wanted to. And, and you didn't know if he was black or white. And he was, you know, his band was racially mixed. and His music was 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 culturally mixed. And I mean, right. he was. He, you're, we're, the society is still 30 years behind Prince um, right now. I mean, the guy was so far ahead on everything. Uh, so, you know. Definitely. And of course, we all want to see like the tax bill paid. I don't know if COVID, if that's being delayed or what's going on, but um, how do I put it? Um, with him not here anymore, obviously things are different. And it's just, it's somewhat frustrating for people that are in this room that worked for him and knew what he wanted and things not being done. It right. seems like they're not going to them and that, you know, how do you feel about that? It's kind of like, you know, they're putting a thing to where they're going forward, but not using the people that he had that helped and knew him uh, the best, not disrespecting them in any way, at yeah. all, you know? That was that was I think the hardest thing for all of us in the camp, you know, as we call it, you know, the, the Prince camp. All of a sudden, in, you know, one day, it's how he wants it, 
and it was nuts and, and difficult and, you know, all over the place. And all of us had our, you know, I call it the purple train. You know, it came when it wanted to come and left when it wanted to leave. Sometimes you're on it, sometimes you weren't. You know, it just, you know, so, you know, I don't want to valorize, you know, Prince World or Prince Camp, you know, beyond what it was. I mean, it was, you know, changed all of our lives, but it was also, you know, mm-hmm. it was very challenging. Uh, but it, 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 it worked. It was, it was what it was. And then suddenly, you know, the next day he's gone. Um, I remember going to Paisley. He died on a Thursday. I got to Paisley on on that Saturday. You know, tens of thousands of people outside of, of, of Paisley. Um, you know, purple flowers everywhere. People put, you know, putting stuff on the fence. Uh, Damaris and I, uh, you know, walk in together. And I'm going to tell you an honest truth. As soon as we walked in the building and closed the door behind us, mm-hmm. if nobody had told me that Prince was dead, I would have known he was dead. Because every other time I walked into Paisley Park, it was like being on the inside of a battery. There was so much energy and life and magic, weird stuff you know, going on. It just right. felt like currents just running through the building that you couldn't really identify and you know the the, the 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 motorcycle from purple rain and all of the awards and trophies and everything from the the, the glory days and, and and the art on the walls but it was just like an of this living paisley park like this living power center and when you walked in there you felt free like you could do anything no dream was too big there were no clocks there's no windows so you could be there for hours and hours not even you lose track of time and I walk, we walk in there, we close the door, and it's like walking into like a refrigerator. Right. Nothing's different physically. Everything is, ex- I mean, it's, it's only been a couple of days. Everything's literally exactly as it was. There's nothing in that building, it, it, energetically. It's just like a tomb. And I looked at Damaris, and Damaris looked at me, and she started, you know, bawling. Just, he's gone. And, and then it just go. It just got worse and worse after that because now suddenly, people who haven't been around for a long time show up, and they want it to be the way that it was 20 years ago or before. God bless them. Uh, family members, some have been close, some have not been close. They want to have their say. They have a right to. God bless them. You have the the most recent camp of people who kind of knew where all the <laughs> forks and spoons were in the building, and nobody wants to hear from us. So you know. God bless us. And then you've got all the old band members and, and it's like suddenly uh, it's like a, a giant tree that was the center of an ecosystem for a whole forest has fallen. And now all the different critters and all the different things and the branches and around we all come scrambling and running around and nobody knows what the heck to do. And, and when it all calms back down, uh, that how he had wanted it near the end. Who knows what he said in 1973? I have no idea. Or what he said, you know, probably too young, it was 1987. But I knew what he was saying the last years of his life, what he wanted. And um, those things, uh, you know, that's not what's happening. And right. so, you know, I think that uh, the same guy that made all that stuff uh, and the same guy that was growing every day and the same guy that was developing every day, uh, you know, he, he had a view about what he thought was good, what he thought was bad. Uh, I wish that view uh, had more impact than it does. But, you know, uh, I know the people who are involved are doing the best they can. Right. Now, was the last time that you saw him and saw him perform, was at um, the Bay Area shows uh, Mm -hmm. for piano and microphone? Because someone was telling me that they saw you like with a big smile at your show, at the shows and especially the after show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the last time I saw him alive, I, mean, I heard from him uh, after you know the, the, the incident on the plane and all that. Um, uh, but um, the last time I saw him alive was in the Bay Area at the the piano uh, and microphone show, and uh, he was so happy because Apollonia was there, and um, uh, you know I, I you know. I don't know how often they saw each other, but it was it was clear he was super happy that she was there, and they you know talked and, and spent time and 
it was just such an amazing thing that you know I grew up watching Purple Rain every weekend on the VHS like my whole high school, um, and uh, mm-hmm. and so that was really cool. That's my first time ever meeting her. You know, she's you know obviously a legend and an icon, and some uh, Black Lives Matter activists from you know the Bay Area. Uh, we had, we had gotten them up to you know, at the after show up on up to the level where he was. And they're standing in the corner, eyes big as plates, you know, like, shit, that's Prince, you know? Right. And my Prince is, you know, he's talking, he's doing his thing or whatever. And, um, and he, you know, but he had that uh, ESP, you know, Prince always knew what was going on. Um, he didn't tell him anything. And all of a sudden, you know, he would kind of like disappear in one place and appear in different, another place, and you nobody ever saw him move. <laughs> you know, you do all that weird like Batman stuff, right. and um, all of a sudden, poof, he's like right there. Uh, and you know, it's like holy crap, this is Prince. And I said, you know, I said Prince, these are some of the best activists in the Bay Area fighting for justice. And um, you know, they got a chance to go to your show. He made some tickets available, so they got a chance to go there to your to your show. They just wanted to thank you. Right. And then he goes, no, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for what you're doing. Very important. Kids eyes are like, and, um, you know, they may have said another word or two, but I mean, just the fact that he was like, no, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. And then, um, so then I'm trying to get the kids out of there because, you know, it's, it's, uh, two in the morning. It's, it's late. You know, like we got to get them back to open. They, we, the after shows in San Francisco. Right. And, um, and I'm kind of hurting them down, about to hurt them down the stairs. And Prince turns and he says, Van. And I said, yeah. And he said, bring the boys. Now, what he meant was bring my sons to Paisley Park. He had been telling me for years, uh-huh. I want your kids to come to Paisley Park. I want your sons. Because whenever we were in, in L.A., I'd bring my sons. To, whenever he was in L.A., I'd bring my sons to see him in L.A. Mm-hmm. But he wanted them to come to Paisley Park. And so as I'm literally about to take these, you know, these young people, not my kids, but these, you know, you know teenage, you know, people down the stairs and get them out of there and get them back over to Oakland. He says, man, I said, yeah, he says, bring the boys. Right. Said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I promise this time. Every time I say I'm going to bring it, never brought it. I promise this time. I promise. I promise. He goes, okay. Mm-hmm. Never saw him again. Uh, have you taken them since? You know, I haven't because, um, you know, I've been back to Paisley, I think, mm-hmm. twice uh, since, you know, it's been under the new management. Uh, it's just so different. You know, it's just so different. Not better, not worse. It, it serves a purpose. I mean, if you've never been to Paisley, if you didn't know Prince, if you didn't know all, you know, how it really had been, that's Paisley Park to you. It's right. the only Paisley Park you're ever going to have. I'm never going to put it down. I'm never going to go this, that, the other thing, because that's the only Paisley Park millions and millions of people are ever going to see. But for me, the Paisley I wanted to take them to doesn't exist. And so... I just haven't, I haven't prioritized. At some point, I'll take them, uh, but it, it's just been too hard. Uh, it, it, whenever I think about it, it's just, I, I just think about I should have brought him when it was the Paisley that I knew. Um, right. He was asking me every summer, "Bring the boys, bring the boys, bring the boys," and I never did. It's just one of those things. Hopefully, in the future, maybe things will be different. You'll be able to take them. Um, yeah. I do appreciate your time. Was there anything that we haven't talked about that you were wanting to bring up or anything to leave with? No, I just, I just, uh, I just appreciate, you know, all the people who, you know, third eye girl and like, you know, all, you know, uh, Janelle Monet and, you know, there's a bunch of us that, that were there the last five, six, seven years. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, Prince camp was different in the eighties with, you know, the revolution. It was different with, new power generations. So, you know, God bless all of those, those incarnations of Prince camp. But for those of us who were there for the last of it, um, you know, we'll, we'll, I guarantee you every single one of us sometime in the last week of our lives, 
we'll say if we live, if we live to be 97 mm-hmm. sometime in the last week of our lives we'll say something about prince i mean right. that what a big impact he had on all of us um they, i mean they, it's inconceivable that a week would go by in my life that i'll mention prince even if i'm 106 you know uh and and it, 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 look, I, I got a chance to work for president obama uh I taught at princeton i, I mean i've you know I'm on CNN. I've done a lot of really cool stuff. The, the most transformative, mm-hmm. life-changing part of my whole story, uh, once I, after I left my parents' house, meeting Prince Rogers and That's very cool. And people were like saying what was like the last thing that Prince would want us to know. And I just feel Prince would want you to know his music and stuff like that. That's my opinion, my theory. Mm-hmm. I don't know mm-hmm. if you're closing on that, but uh yeah, well, That's listen, it's all, it's, it's all there. It's all there in the music. Um, yeah. And we got a chance to see, um, you know, the, the, the center of that solar system was 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 the music. But there are a lot of other planets in that solar system as well. In terms of the activism, the philanthropy, the the religion, the the, the philosophy and all that kind of stuff. But this but right. this but the soul, the center of that solar system, the sun in that solar system was the music. And thank God, thank goodness we still have it. All right. Thank you so much, Van, for your time. I really appreciate it, you taking the time out of your schedule. Hope to have you back on. We no, will have you on for a while, but. Yeah, no, it's good. I, I uh, you, you said if we got a chance to talk about Prince for an hour, I'd feel better, and I sure do. See? So. There we go. It worked. Instead of feeling blue, now a little bit purple, right? A little bit purple. Love All right, it. man. Thank good you. seeing you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We'll come off of that. But yeah. All right, guys. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We're going to be doing the after show. Give me around 10 minutes and we'll meet back here to discuss it. Just have it at this point, discuss some other things going on. I want to thank uh, the people coming in, Hannah, Shelby, Ruth, Dave, of course, always. Um, we'll talk about the serious things and some other things uh, going on and about this conversation. And I saw some of the comments going off, you didn't have the normal people in here. It felt like a uh, MP DMC chat. <laughs> um, but thank you guys so much again um, for subscribing on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, the other places that we're at. We we'll always appreciate your donations to get the show better. We have something here that uh, DH helped us with, uh, showing up a little bit in the background in the next few shows, hopefully. Um, but again, thank you so much. Thanks to Van for being on. And I look forward to the after show so we can really let uh, some comments go. And of course, if anyone wants to join in on that, we can bring you in as well. But till then, um, much love. Keep it funky. We're about to check out.